Hi everybody. Uh, today we're going to talk real quickly about uh, reliability and conducting some reli reliability tests in, uh, using Excel, using the Excel program. Um, the reliability itself is demonstrated through uh, the stable and consistent replication of findings on repeated measurements. And essentially what that means is uh, your instrument, generally survey instruments in social sciences, they should replicate the same findings, all right? So if I was administered you a questionnaire based on uh, your feelings or attitudes towards, you know, your your job or, you know, um, or towards ice cream or whatever, that the questionnaire should be, uh, I should be able to administer at one time and I should get consistent results across time and then repeated measurements and that type of stuff. Uh, the way I really like to think about reliability is like um, uh, police officers when they're um, using uh, the radar gun to assess people's uh, speed in a speed trap or whatever you want to call it, right? Um, but, uh, you know, that instrument, the instrument they're using, it should be reliable, you know? It should tell if somebody's going 40 miles an hour or 50 miles an hour, and if they're going 50 miles an hour, you should be able to continually do that over time and time and time again, right? And, uh, you know, that's why you want to calibrate your instrument and all that type of stuff, but... Uh, on that note, things can be reliably wrong. So uh, say vehicles are going 40 miles an hour and the uh, radar gun is clocking them at 50. Um, and it clocks it at 50 and 50 every person that's going by. So it's 10 off, but it's reliably wrong. So that could be the case as well. So uh, just because something's reliable doesn't necessarily mean it's valid. It needs to be further investigated. But reliability is one component of validity. Okay, so it asks if... Uh, study were repeated would the instrument yield stable and uniform uh, measures so um, generally if you want to think of like large scale tests as far as reliability is concerned like the iq tests uh, the gre um, the law school test the lsat the sat these things they need to be reliable and they're consist consistently used over time and in different locations in different places so we're going to talk real quickly about uh, four different methods of uh, reliability and then we're going to work through a couple quick examples in Excel okay so first and foremost the test retest method uh, when you want to examine whether a test is reliable over time so uh, conducting a test that one in if you conduct for example uh, if looking at an IQ test if you if everybody was administered an IQ test in, uh, in April and then again in, in October the results should be fairly similar okay because even though um, you, that's reliable, I, I mean, even though you learn, you learn as you grow, regardless, hopefully you're doing that, but um, the instrument should be itself. It shouldn't have like a, a score of 120 on the April test and then a score of 80 on the October test. There's probably something wrong with your instrument. The same goes with the GRE and the LSAT, the LSAT and all those type of things. How do we compute it using the pro, uh, Pearson's product moment correlation, the Pearson's R? Uh, we talked about um, that uh, in the previous videos. Uh, certainly, this is an indicator of a strong relationship. The values that you achieve is over 0.8. is very, very good uh, indicator that the test is fairly reliable over time. A test and then a retest, okay? So that's one way to assess an instrument, okay? Uh, parallel forms reliability. This is another form of reliability. It's used when examining the similarity between two different forms of the same test. So uh, use when you want to know whether several forms of a test are reliable or equivalent. Um, I, I go back to the GRE example, right? The graduate uh, entrance exam, uh, you know. Uh, if you take the test, once and then you take it again you'll probably get completely different questions okay um but it your scores are probably going to be very similar if not the exact same okay um although the questions change they're assessing basically the same type of domain all right the same you know your vocabulary and your math skills and these types of things just general skills okay um uh in, in there are two different forms of the test but you're still achieving the same results basically all right um yeah, that's parallel forms, and uh, it's calculated using the same method as the previous one, the test retest method, uh, the Pearson's product moment correlation, the Pearson's R, uh, and like I said previously, go back and, and look at that, um, uh, how to uh, conduct the Pearson's R, and we'll look at it again in a few minutes when we look at uh, the Excel example.
go. The third form that we're going to discuss is internal consistency reliability. It's used when you want to know whether an item on a test assess one and only one dimension. So um, generally these are used when you're developing like a, a, a composite or an index, okay? Like a, some people call them scales, but it's more concisely noted as an index. So if you want to assess depression, Right. You can ask somebody if they're depressed. That's one question. It doesn't really get into the full domain of depression. The assessing like clinically assessing what depression is, you know, you're going to have a questionnaire. So it might include five different questions. Are you uh, having trouble sleeping? Are you not eating well? Um, you know, do you feel sad constantly in the past two weeks? How often have you felt lonely, depressed, whatever? And all these questions combined. Right. Uh, if you have a question on that, those five questions and that says, uh, you know, do you like ice cream? That's like completely irrelevant. So, um, you know, you want to assess and, and things don't become that convoluted usually. All right. I know that's an extreme example, but uh, generally you want to assess that it's measuring that domain, that one dimension, depression, whatever it is. And this can be applied. This is applied often in psychology when developing indexes. And even within criminology, when you're looking at delinquency, a delinquency index, um, things highly correlate with substance use and all that type of stuff. So using the Kornbrox Alpha as a way to measure the internal consistency, we're going to talk more about that later. Uh, there's other videos accessible uh, about this, but this is generally um, how these things are rated. Okay, when you're developing an index, uh, later on in, in subsequent videos from now, we'll look at indexes and developing that and looking at that type of stuff. But uh, apparently it's determining whether... It's looking at that one dimension, anxiety or depression or PTSD or happiness or whatever you want to call it, okay? Uh, or psychopathy, you know, uh, anything you want to look at. Um, the final thing we're going to talk about is inter-rater uh, reliability. Now, this is looking at uh, how much two raters agree on their judgments of a some outcome, right? Uh, so examples for this is when you have two independent judges. Um, I don't know if y'all ever watched the Food Network or whatever. Um, you know, and they have different judges coming out to see on, on that show Chopped or Beat Bobby Flay when everybody has their own opinions like, oh, this is really good or this is really bad. Uh, you want consistency between that, right? You want to have a fair assessment. You want to have the competitors have an equal opportunity, right, uh, to be successful and based on an objective measure, not the subjective influence of that individual's interpretation of what good food is, right, or what a good dive is in the Olympics or how good they dismounted the vault or you know, um, you know, referees, I know the football, there's a lot of subjectivity within referees on how they call what's a holding call or what's not a holding call or, um, you know, those types of things. And use of force scenarios, right? Shoot, don't shoot, um, or those types of things, you know. Uh, and if you line two different people, you can get an assessment if this is a good indicator for um, whether or not it, it should be used or those judges uh, overlap or, you know, they adhere to the standards, okay? Uh, so how do you compute this? Uh, the total number of agreements over the total number of uh, possible agreements. And this is simple computation. And this is a kind of a, a quick reference to tell you whether it's good or not. Uh, whether it's good is generally over 0 0.6 to 0.8 and very good is 0 0.8 and above. So moderate, anywhere between here, judges are agreeing basically half the time, okay? At 0.5, they're only half the time they're agreeing. But over here, uh, you know, 8 out of 10 times is 0.8 and above is they're agreeing, right? And a 1.0 is they're agreeing 100% of the time. So if they're agreeing less than 20% of the time, it's extremely poor. So uh, beyond that, I'm just going to work through a quick example. I'm going to do a test retest example and then an inter-rater reliability example. So if we go back to the test retest method, we want to determine whether a test is reliable over time. And then we do the... Pearson's R, calculate that, right? <laughs> so to do this in Excel, uh, it's a simple function. You just hit equals Corey, C O R R E L, the E L. Then you do open parenthesis and see how it says array one here. This is the first column that we want to include, okay? It is E4 through E18. See how that's highlighted? Then I'll put a comma here, and then it says array two here, okay? This is the second values that you want to include. So F4 through F18. Now close the parentheses and hit enter. Okay. 
And as you can see, these values for an I2 test, these are all manufacturing numbers, something I came up with. All right, and this, this, this column here, I'm sorry, I didn't describe it. The subjects, subjects 1 through 15 uh, in the April test and the November test, right? And uh, these are all made up numbers, but you can see they're fairly uh, close to one another each time, and they're highly correlated, okay? A, nine, a 0.96 is a very good indicator, so it's called, considered to be a very strong relationship based on the interpretation. Uh, I think in page 144 in your textbook, it has that little scale there as well. All right, so that would be um, a reliable test over time, okay? A test retest example. Now, the second example we want to look at is inter rater reliability, okay? So we got referee scores, uh, observation periods. Uh, so they looked at 20 different observations, and you got judge one and judge two. Uh, if you want to make up a yes, no as a one being a yes and a zero being a no, that would be fine, saying that they. Uh, I, any scenario that I just talked about a minute ago, uh, if the dive was good in the Olympics or, you know, they did a great floor, floor routine, the gymnast, or, you know, if you shoot, don't shoot type of scenario or anything like that, or, you know, beat Bobby Flay or top, top that individual or whatever, okay? Um, you know, this is just looking at that. So uh, to calculate this, um, as far as inter-rater reliability, if we go back and we look at it, it's the total number of agreements over the total number of possible agreements, okay? So here, we know that uh, if 1 and 1, if we add 1 plus 1, right, that should equal 2. And they both agree, all right? This one agrees as well, and this one ag agrees on a 0, okay? Uh, the ones that don't agree are a 1 and a 0, okay? So a quick way to do this, you can actually sum this. Sum remember the sum function um, sum this cell uh, with this cell okay n4 to uh, o4 okay and I'll put a close parenthesis and then I know that's a 2 right uh, and I can do it again here sum equals sum 5 and I can go all the way down and do this right equal um, that should equal zero, okay? Now, another way to do this, you can drag this down, and it'll, Excel is pretty nifty that it will input the, the um, function for you as you drag it down. Just you want to make sure and go back and check because sometimes something happens, you do something wrong, and it doesn't necessarily know what you're trying to get at. But, you know, this is two, this is agreement, this is agreement. This is a disagreement. So all the ones are disagreements. So we can go on and highlight there, highlight here, highlight here, right? And all these are the disagreements because one got a one and one got a zero, right? Do it again, and we'll do it again, all right? So we know these are all the disagreements. Um, if you want to, there's another way to add on to this and a new function that I haven't really talked about. You can determine how many ones are in this column by using a COUNTIF uh, function. Count if, okay? You see it right here, it's highlighted. Now to open parentheses and it, it's asking me for the range. The range, I want to look at the COUNTIF function in this column because I want to see all the disagreement. All right? See how that is. And then it says comma criteria there. I know that's in the way. Comma criteria, and I want to look at the ones, so I'll do that, close column. So I got nine ones is what this, this function is telling me right here, okay, because I'm looking at this column, P4 through P23, so I can count this up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and that's correct, right? Now, I know that the total disagreement number is nine, and I know that I have 20 different um, 20 different uh, ratings. So if I want to calculate this, the inter rater reliability, the total number of agreements over the total number of possible agreements, I know that it's total number of agreements equals 11, 11 divided by 20, right? And that's my inter rater reliability coefficient, okay? Now hopefully I didn't go too fast, but uh, you know, hopefully y'all can see that. And that's how you can compute the inter-rater reliability coefficient.
uh, as far as telling whether it's a good or it's a bad type of value, uh, this is a good metric to use here as well. So uh, what number did I have? A 0.55 uh, is going to be considered a moderate. So that's how you would interpret, interpret that value, a moderate value, a moderate uh, as opposed to very good, which is over 0.8, or 0.6, which is very good, which is just good itself. Okay, so hopefully this helps y'all. Um, you know, and uh, I hope y'all have a good one. Take care. Bye bye.